Hello, as you can see, I am stood outside uh, the Savoy, which is uh, closed because everything is. So a few of us from various aspects of the Savoy, um, players, the parents, people from Panto, um, mothers and of children of the Savoy players and so forth, uh, decided to get together and just do something uh, just to keep the Savoy going um, in these times. Um, it's difficult for Dan and Haley. we appreciate that, to, to try and actually keep the name out there. So we have for you a sort of rehearsed reading of A Midsummer Night's Dream. Now it's in five acts, this is going to just get noisy up by the road. <laughs> um, it's in five acts and we will present each act in a different video. Um, we've been putting this together during the lockdown over Zoom, uh, which is how we've recorded it, so we are all still distanced. Um, and uh, you'd think lockdown would mean that everyone just had loads of time to spare, and it's not actually the case. Everyone's got loads of stuff on still. Um, so you will see different actors playing different parts across various scenes, just because we had to get it done and work to people's availability. Um, not everyone is an experienced reader, not everyone is an experienced actor. Um, you've got uh, a full range of different people from different backgrounds, different abilities, different experiences. Um, so it's not a fully polished RSC performance by any stretch. But we do hope you find it enjoyable. We do hope it just keeps you entertained a little bit since we can't do it behind these doors. Uh, and we all hope to see you in there very, very soon. Take care. Act 1, Scene 1, Athens, the Palace of Theseus. Enter Theseus, Hippolyta, Philostrati, and attendants. Now for Hippolyta, that nuptial hour draws on apace. Four happy days bring in another moon, but oh, methinks how slow this old moon wanes. She lingers my desires, like to a stepdame or a dowager, long withering out a young man revenue. Four days will quickly steep themselves in night. Four nights will quickly dream away the time. And then the moon, like to a silver bow new bent in heaven, shall behold the night of our solemnities. Go, Philostrata, stir up the Athenian youth to merriments. Awake the pert and nimble spirit of mirth. Turn melancholy forth the funerals. The pale companion is not for our pomp. Hippolyta, I wooed thee with my sword and won thy love doing the injuries. But I will wed thee in another key, with pomp, with triumph, and with reveling. Enter Aegeus, Hermia, Lysander, and Demetrius. Happy be Theseus, our renowned Duke. Thanks, good Aegeus. What's the news with thee? Full of vexation, Kamai, with complaint against my child my daughter Hermia. Stand forth, Demetrius, my noble lord. This man hath my consent to marry her. Stand forth, Lysander, and my gracious duke. This man hath bewitched the bosom of my child. Thou, thou, Lysander, thou hast given her rhymes and interchanged love tokens with my child. Thou hast by moonlight had her window sung with feigning voice verses of feigning love and stolen the impression of a fantasy with bracelets of thy hair, rings, gourds, conceits, naps, trifle, nosegays, sweetmeats, messengers of strong prevailment in hardened youth. With cannon hast thou flitched my daughter's heart, turned it obedient, which is due to me, to stubborn harshness. And my gracious duke, be it so she, will not you before your grace, consent to marry with Demetrius. I beg the ancient privilege of Athens, as she is mine, I may dispose of her, which shall be either to this gentleman or to her death, according to our law, immediately provided in that case. What say you, Hermia? Be advised, fair maid, to you your father should be as a god, one that composed your beauties, yea, and one to whom you are but as a form in wax by him imprinted, and within his power to leave the figure or disfigure it. Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. So is Lysander. In himself he is, but in this kind, wanting your father's voice, the other must be held the worthier. I would my mother looked, but with my eyes. 
Rather, your eyes must with his judgment look. I do entreat your grace to pardon me. I know not by what power I am made bold, nor how it may concern my modesty, in such a presence here to plead my thoughts. But I beseech your grace that I may know the worst that may befall me in this case, if I refuse to wed Demetrius. Either to die the death, or to abjure forever the society of men. Therefore, fair Hermia, question your desires, know of your youth, examine well your blood, whether, if you yield not to your father's choice, you can endure the livery of a nun. For I, to be in shady cloistered mood, to live a barren sister all your life, chanting faint hymns to the cold fruitless moon, thrice blessed they that master so their blood, to undergo such maiden pilgrimage. But earthlier happy is the rose distilled than that which withering on the virgin thorn grows, lives, and dies in single blessedness. So will I grow, so live, so die, my lord, and I will my virgin paint up unto his lordship, whose unwished yoke my soul consents not to give sovereignty. Take time to pause, and by the next new moon, the sealing day betwixt my love and me for everlasting bond of fellowship, upon that day either prepare to die for disobedience to your father's will, or else to wed Demetrius as he would, or on Diana's altar to protest for I austerity and single life. Relent, sweet Hermia, and Lysander, yield thy crazy title to my certain right. You have her mother's love, Demetrius. Let me have Hermia's. Do you marry him? Scornful, Lysander. True, he hath my love, and what is mine, my love shall render him. And she is mine, and all my right of her. I do estate unto Demetrius. I am, my lady, as well derived as he, as well possessed. My love is more than his. My fortunes every way is fairly ranked, if not with vantage, it's Demetrius. And, which is more than all these boasts can be, I am beloved, beauteous Hermia. Why should not I then prosecute my right? Demetrius, I'll avouch it to his head made love to Nedda's daughter, Helena, and won her soul, and she, sweet lady, dotes devoutly dotes, dotes in idolatry upon this spotted and inconstant man. I must confess that I have heard so much, and with Demetrius thought to have spoke thereof, but being over full of self-affairs, my mind did lose it. But Demetrius, come. And come, Aegeus, you shall go with me. I have some private schooling for you both. For you, fair Hermia, look you arm yourself to fit your fancies to your mother's will. Or else the law of Athens yields you up, which by no means we may extenuate, to death or to a vow of single life. Come, my Hippolyta, what cheer, my love? Demetrius and Aegeus, go along. I must employ you in some business against our nuptial and confer with you of something nearly that concerns yourselves. With duty and desire, we follow you. Exeunt all but Lysander and Hermia. How now, my love? Why is your cheek so pale? How chance the roses there do fade so fast? Be like for want of rain, which I could well but seem them from the tempest of my eyes. Ay, me, for aught that I could ever read, could ever hear by tale or history, the course of true love never did run smooth, but either it was different in blood. Oh, cross, too high to be enthralled too low. Or else misgraft in respect of years. Oh, spite, too old to be engaged too young. Or it stood upon the choice of friends. Oh, hell, to choose love by another's eyes. Or... If there were a sympathy and choice, war, death, or sickness did lay siege to it, making it momentary as a sound, swift as a shadow, short as any dream, brief as the lightning in the collied night, that in a spleen unfolds both heaven and earth, and ere a man hath power to say, Behold, the jaws of darkness do devour it up, so quick bright things come to confusion. If then true lovers have ever been crossed, it stands as an edict in destiny. Then let us teach our trial patience, because it is a customary cross, as due to love as thoughts and dreams and sighs, wishes and tears, for fancies follow us. A good persuasion. Therefore hear me, Hermia. I have a widow aunt, a dowager of great revenue, and she hath no child. From Athens is her house remote seven leagues, and she respects me as her only son. There, gentle Hermia, may I marry thee, 
and to that place the sharp Athenian law cannot pursue us. If thou lovest me then, steal forth thy mother's house tomorrow night, and in the wood, a league without the town, where I did meet thee once with Helena, to do observance to a morn of May, there will I stay for thee. My good Lysander, I swear to thee, by Cupid's strongest bow, by his best arrow with the golden head, by the simplicity of Venus's doves, by that which knitteth souls and prospers loves, by that the fire which burned the Carthage queen when false Trojan horse was sailed seen, by all the vows that ever men have broke in number more than ever women spoke, in that same place thou hast appointed me, tomorrow truly will I meet with thee. He promised love. Look, here comes Helena. Enter Helena. God speed, fair Helena. Whither away? Oh, you me fair? But fair again, and say, Demetrius loves you fair. O oh, happy fair, your eyes are load stars, and your tongue sweet air, more tunable than lark to shepherd's ear. When wheat is green, when hawthorn buds appear, sickness is catching. O oh, with favour so, yours would I catch, fair Hermia, ere I go. My ear should catch your voice, my eye your eye. My tongue should catch your tongue's sweet melody, with the world mine, Demetrius be invaded, the rest I give to be to you translated. Oh, teach me how you look, and with what art you sway the motion of Demetrius's heart. Frown upon him, yet he loves me still. Oh, that your frowns would teach my smile such skill. I give him curses, yet he gives me love. Oh, that my prayers could such affection move. The more I hate, the more he follows me. The more I love, the more he hates me. His folly, Helena, is no fault mm -hmm. of mine. None but your beauty with that fault were mine. Take comfort. He no more shall see my face. Lysander and myself will fly this place. Before the time I did Lysander see, seemed Athens as a paradise to me. O oh, then what graces in my love do dwell, that he hath turned a heaven unto hell. Helen, you are minds we will unfold. Tomorrow night, when Phoebe doth behold her silver visage in the watery glass, decking with liquid pearl the bladed grass, a time that lovers' flights doth still conceal, through Athens' gates have we devised to steal. And in the wood where often you and I upon faint primrose beds were wont to lie, emptying our bosoms of their counsels sweet, there my Lysander and myself shall meet, and thence from Athens turn away our eyes to seek new friends and stranger companies. Farewell, sweet playfellow, pray thou for us, and good luck grant thee thy Demetrius. Keep word, Lysander, we must starve our sight from lover's food till morrow deep midnight. I will, my Hermia. Exit Hermia. Helena, adieu, as you on him, Demetrius dote on you. Exit Lysander. Oh, happy some old other son can be, Though Athens I am thought as fair as she. But what of that? Demetrius thinks not so. He would not know what all, but he do know. And as he is doting on Hermia's eyes, So I admiring of his qualities. Things base and vile fold in no quantity. Love can transpose to form and dignity. Love looked not with the eyes, but with the mind, and therefore is winged Cupid painted blind. Nor hath love's mind of any judgment haste, wings and no eyes figure and heedy haste. And therefore is love said to be a child, because in choice he is so oft beguiled. As waggish boys in games themselves forswear, so the boy love is perjured everywhere. For ere Demetrius looked on Hermia's eye, he hailed down oaths that he was only mine. And when this hail some heat from Hermia felt, so he dissolved and showers of oaths did melt. I will go tell him of fair Hermia's flight. Then, to the word, will he tomorrow night pursue her. And for this intelligence, if I have thanks, it is a dear expense. But herein mean I to enrich my pain, to have his sight thither and back again. Exit Helena. Scene two, Athens, Quince's house. Enter Quince, Snug, Bottom, Flute, Snout and Starveling. 
Is all our company hit? You are best to call them generally, man by man, according to the script. Here is the scroll of every man's name which is thought fit through all Athens to play in our interlude before the Duke and the Duchess on his wedding day at night. First, good Peter Quince, say what the play treats on, then read the names of the actors, and so grow to a point. Mary, our play is the most lamentable of comedy and most cruel death of Pyramus and Thisbe. A very good piece of work, I assure you. And a Mary. Now, good Peter Quince, call forty your actors on the scroll. Masters, ask yourselves. Answer as I call you. Nick Bottom the Weaver. Ready? Uh, name what part I am for and uh, proceed. You, Nick Bottom, are set down for Pyramus. What is Pyramus? A lover or a tyrant? Oh, a lover that kills himself most gallant for love. Ooh, they will ask for some tears in the true performing of it. If I do it, would the audience look to their eyes? I will move storms. I will condole in some measure. To the rest, yet my chief humour is for a tyrant. I would play Ercles, really, or a part tear a cat in to make all split. The raging rocks, the shivering shocks, shall break the locks of prison gates. Amphibious car shall shine from far and make a mar the foolish fates. This was lofty. <laughs> now, name the rest of the players. Uh, this is Ercles' vein, a tyrant's vein. A lover is more condoling. Francis Flute, the bellows mender. Here, Peter Prince. Flute, you must take Thisbe on you. What is this be? A wandering knight? It is the lady that Pyramus must love. Nay, faith, let me not play a woman. I have a beard coming. <laughs> That's all one. You shall play it in a mask, and you may speak as small as you will. Oh, and I may hide my face. Let me play this be too. Mm. I'll speak in a monstrous little voice. Is there? Is there? Ah, oh, Pyramus is lover, dear. Thy Thisbe, dear, and lady, dear. No, no, you must play Pyramus and flute, you Thisbe. Well, proceed. Robin Starveling, the tailor. You, Peter Quince. Robin Starveling, you must play Thisbe's mother. Tom Snout, the tinker. Here, Peter Quince. You, Pyramus's father. Myself, Thisbe's father. Snug the joiner, you the lion's part. And I hope it is a play well fitted. Ha, have you the lion's part written? If you bid me, give it me, for I am slow of study. <laughs> you may do it extempore, for it is nothing but roaring. Oh, let me play the lion too. I will roar. I will do. Any man's heart good to hear me. I will roar. I will make the Duke say, let him roar again, let him roar again. And you should do it too terribly. You would fright the Duchess and the ladies, that they would shriek, and that were enough to hang us all. That would hang us, every mother's son. I grant you, friends, if you should fright the ladies out of their wits, they would have no more discretion but to hang us. But I will aggravate my voice so that I will roar as gently as any sucking dove. I will roar as you twirl on my finger. You can play no part but Pyramus. For, for Pyramus is a sweet-faced man. A proper man, as one shall see in a hammer's day. A most lovely gentleman-like man. Therefore, you must needs play Pyramus. Well, I will undertake it. What beard would I best play it in? Uh, what you will. I will discharge it either in your straw beard, your orange tawny beard, your purple green beard, or your French crown colour beard, a perfect yellow. Some of your French crowns have no hair at all, and then you will play barefaced. But, masters, here are your parts. And I am to entreat you, request you, and desire you to con them by
by tomorrow night. And meet me in the Paris wood a mile without the town. By moonlight, there will we rehearse. For if we meet in the city, we shall be dogged with company and our devices known. In the meantime, I will draw a bill of properties such as our play. I pray you, fail me not. We will meet. And there we may rehearse the most obscenely and courageously. Take pains, be perfect. Adieu. At the Duke's Oak we meet. Enough. Hold or cut your bowstrings. Yeah. Excellent.